I want to welcome uh, Stephanie Giesen. Stephanie um, is uh, is working right now in Germany. Stephanie did his her degree in Darmstadt, and afterwards she moved to Leipzig, and also she stayed for a while in uh, Moscow in Russia uh, when she did her master's degree. Uh, Stephanie has been working on all this world of um, energy and energy resources and economics. And for us, it's a pleasure, Stephanie, that you will be with us. I know that it's already late in Germany. Uh, so welcome. I want to inform everybody that the meeting has it is recorded, so you can uh, watch it afterwards if you want in our YouTube channel. And you can follow us also in our social media, you, um, Facebook, Instagram, and our website, acstechcr.com, acstechcr.com. So I want to give the, the word to Stephanie. So welcome, Stephanie. Gracias, bienvenida. Welcome. Thank you. Gracias. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, everyone, thank you very much, Isaac, for your nice introduction words. Um, I need a second just to share my screen. I prepared for you a um, presentation. And one moment. So I hope it's uh, visible so far. Yes, we are watching. Ah, perfectly. So I just change uh, in full screen. And yes, I really like to welcome you all to the presentation, 100 years of electricity working for a grid operator in the north of Germany. Um, my name is Stephanie Giesing. Um, hola, you say in Spain or in Costa Rica. Uh, in my case, or in the north of Germany, it would be Moin Moin. <laughs> yeah, as Isaac mentioned, my name is Stephanie Giesing. I'm 32 years old. Uh, I made a degree in uh, international energy economics. Um, as far as Isaac informed me, you have a similar degree or a degree in engineering or topics that are related in energy economics. That is something we might have in common. Um, when I'm not working, I really love to do yoga. I love to go out bicycling. And I also love to play on a PlayStation. <laughs> and especially in the north of Germany, unfortunately, we don't have so nice weather, so especially during the winter time, it's very often very gray. So um, my living room and my TV is much more invitable than going outside and uh, spending it there and freezing. <laughs> um, yes, I'm living in Hamburg. It's actually um, it's a bigger city in, in Germany, in the northern, or to be exactly in the northern part of Germany. Um, it's a city located on a river called Elba, so it's yeah, quite maritime. It has a really nice harbor. It has a long history in, in shipping and trading, and um, yeah, it's trying to inventing itself new has also quite nice new architecture inside, like the Alt uh, Harmony. And yeah, I'm living here together with 1.8 million other people. <laughs> and uh, yeah, actually, it's really nice today uh, to spend today with you and have now a small presentation. So actually, what we, are we going to talk about? So uh, first of all, I just want to show what to do with a degree in energy economics, or at least what I did with this kind of degree, uh, how it is to work in the energy sector, and um, at least current topics of the energy sector in Germany. As Isaac mentioned, I started my degree in energy economics in Darmstadt, was from 2007 to 2010. Um, Darmstadt is a city located more in the middle 
of Germany. And um, actually this study was designed that to receive an overview about energy technology, energy economics in Germany and uh, energy law in Germany. Uh, during this study, uh, are at this time, renewable energies play a big role in Germany it was the beginning of the renewable energy revolution, I would say. And um, so a lot of people needed that kind or a lot of company needed employees and people with that kind of expertise. Um, during the study, I went to Asia, more exactly to Taiwan and there in a city called Kaohsiung. It's also a big Haber city. I think around five million people must live there and uh, it's one of or has one of the biggest Habers in the world. So they are yeah, shipping yeah, a lot of stuff all around the world. And there I was working for the European Energy Center and there did a lot of market research and we're interested in what is actually happening in Europe with all those renewable energies. And when you followed maybe a little bit the history of uh, German's renewable energy system, we we're in the beginning quite strong with the production of solar panel with solar industry, but actually we are underestimated the possibilities of mass production. So China jumped very quickly on this market and built uh, huge factories and made solar panels to a mass product. And um, yeah, actually one of my, my tasks at this time in Asia was to do a lot of market research because uh, the uh, systems to promote renewable energy in Europe was quite different. And it's always good to know the market conditions you are uh, working with. Um, during this time, I learned also a lot as a working student. And actually, I can give everyone the advice, if you have the possibility to make a study and also work at a company, try to do both because I, I learned a lot of theory uh, during the study, but I learned a lot of how to, to work, to manage, to organize my, my job. So when you are not interested so much in this kind of academic career and all, use your study to go into working place, start as early as possible. <laughs> At this time, I was working for a company called SPIAG. It's also a company that was specialized on services around grid installation, maintenance, and um, also operating. Um, the special part of this kind of products and when you want to, to offer grid system, it's not like a product in the supermarket, you go there, you buy this, maybe coffee there, and then you're happy. Um, it needs a lot more to think about, to figure out, to plan, to organize. And actually a lot of engineers are um, hired there so they could, yeah, do all this project management and think about uh, what is the best for the customer. And there was also a department that supports the sales process um, and also supports the customer relationship management. And this time I was working there in the IT area and this IT um, system supports the sales process. So uh, the, the people there have an overview about the customers, when was the last customer contact, what kind of documents that the customer receive, um, is the offer in time, um, yeah, the customer's place and so on. Um, how happy are they or is, is, is this something special to consider? Uh, I did this for over three years. What was quite interesting, but I had a problem that at this time my um, 
university didn't offer a master degree. So I was a little bit struggling to what to do next. And I actually was searching for something energy related. And um, yeah, in 2011, I found a really nice master program. It's called International Energy Econom Economics. And it was actually a joint study program with a Russian university. So it was not so focused on renewable energies like um, the German study I did before. One um, has now the focus more on all the international energy topics and more the classic resources like um, gas and oil. So I learned there a lot about um, yeah, this, these resources, um, the logistics, logistics behind that kind of resources and also a little bit about the technology and the laws um, on, around this kind of oil and gas business. Uh, during that time, I did an internship at a German insurance company. It was called Allianz and the subsidiary was called Allianz Climate Solutions. Uh, at this time, I was wondering what could have an insurance of a bank, what, what is, have they in common with the energy market? And my mind, I, I thought only people with insurance or um, finance study is working there, but actually, they invest a lot in renewable energy and also in other technology, um, technological fields. And they need expertise in that area because they need to make a decision if it's worth to go there, how risky is it to invest there. And therefore they need, for example, also engineers who receive all the project data. And in my case, I receive project data about um, yeah, solar parks or wind energy power plants that should be built somewhere in Germany. And the task was just to check up all the data I received. I need to check up the um, economic calculation, the technology that was used. And um, yeah, I needed to check um, if it's all, or if it was all correct. And if it's, good for the bank, for example, to invest in that kind of project. It was uh, quite interesting to see this and um, to read all about the projects. And um, yeah, actually it was quite nice, quite nice internship at this time. Um, in 2014, I managed my first job I entered at a company service nets in the area of IT project management. This company belongs to Eon, a huge private energy provider in Germany and also Europe. And this company has the IT backbone for uh, customer data. And um, when you think about maybe an electricity meter in Germany, it's usu usual that the customer is going one time at a year to the um, electricity meter, just uh, read what is, the, what is the current figure, and then they send it to that kind of co um, company, and they created the, the bill for that for the customer and is also was also controlling if the customer was paying when it was paying um, or at least if they pay if not they charge a fee or just uh, look and check up uh, when the payment was going in there and um, yeah also there is now the market changing we um, invest a lot in, in smart meter technology. So that means that we have this old electrical meter where the customer have to go there one time in a year. And now we're trying to change that kind of infrastructure that we know or will have in future. Smart meter means um, electrical meter that is capable to uh, um, measure real-time data of the electricity consumption and send it 
to the IT infrastructure there. And um, yeah, these companies nowadays uh, thinking a lot about developing digital businesses and also uh, products that might be then might be interesting for such kind of smart infrastructure. Um, nevertheless, this year I, after yeah six years of that kind of pro IT project management, I decided to do something completely different. <laughs> Now I'm a team lead for young professional education. In Germany, you have, um, after finishing school, the uh, choice between making an academic career. So you can start a bachelor and after that a master, or you can do some kind of uh, training on job. It's also program for yeah for young people in different topics here for example we are educating people who are interesting in electronics and um, for two and a half up to three and a half years they're learning everything about it they learn how to build to maintain how to operate um, important components for our grid infrastructure and um, yeah actually when we have uh, problems with our Chris, uh, our grid systems or some machines or technologies broken um, those are the people who are going out and check if everything is working if the machine is working and um, they are also capable to repair that kind of technology. So really, really important. Um, yeah, actually, I didn't mention where I work. <laughs> I'm working for the Schleswig-Holstein Netz AG. Um, they celebrate this year uh, their 100th year anniversary and therefore produced a really nice movie I would like to share now with you because it explains a lot where this company um, come from and also a little bit where we want to go in the future. So I will change and I hope you see the movie and also the computer sound. Um, unfortunately, the movie is a little bit, uh, is in German, so I'm going to translate and uh, it's step by step and explain a little bit more. So the first picture and the first uh, seconds of the movie is about Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, it's a rural area in the north of Germany. And as you see in the, um, the year 1900, yeah, everyone was working on the fields with their hands. There were no cars, no um, agra technology that could support. So everyone was working there with hands and horses. Yes. Yeah. Right now, are we not seeing the, the, the presentation? Uh, we are still here to see the presentation, the PDF, but not the video. Ah, I understand. Um, then I need to share my screen completely. I hope now yes. you see the yes. video. Perfect. Okay. So I will go start it again. <laughs> And yeah, actually, the first impression is it quite quite simple. People really work with their hands. Also, the the steam engine wasn't very um, spread in that kind of rural area, and um, the people could not imagine what is electricity and how might look a, um, a life with electricity. So 
with the introduction of electricity, of course, a lot is changing. I mean, and um, you will see when they want to read or do stuff, they use candle or petroleum lights and with electricity, now it changes. Of course, um, that new technology was introduced in the big cities first, and everyone was wondering if this kind of technology is something for the countryside or not. Many people were doubting that it's um, economic or economical to introduce that kind of technology in that uh, in the countryside. And in my perspective, or in the perspective of a um, yeah, of a human in 2020, really unbelievable <laughs> that you could ask even the question if it's worth to electrify the, the country. So 1912, um, politician decided um, the countryside have to be electrified. And actually this was, yeah, the start. <laughs> so in 1920, and this kind of um, electrifying the countryside accelerates more and more. And in 1929, the Schleswig, that was the first name of our company, um, yeah, electrified nearly the whole north of Germany. The next step is um, in the northern part of Germany, we have the mainland, but we also have some islands and step by step, we connected those islands to the mainland too. In 1950, more and more um, electrical technology get into the households. Um, yeah, the technology was more and more sophisticated and yeah, the revolution started. course many people have questions about what is electricity how to use it how to manage it and here also our company um, yeah start to give a lot of information to the people about technology and so on in the 1970s a natural gas was uh, coming to Germany too. And in the northern part of the country, we also start to invest in natural gas infrastructure and build also there uh, a gas, um, yeah, the gas infrastructure. Meanwhile, of course, we have some, or meanwhile, we had some catastrophes like a really huge flood and later on also a lot of snow. And of course, the infrastructure was broken. People had to be reconnected to energy again. And um, yeah, we played there also an important role. Um, 
help during this kind of catastrophes and of course learn a lot about it. So nowadays we have really strong technology and also really reliable technology and um, yeah, we go on with electrifying the country. In 1976, uh, we invested in one of the first um, wind power plants. Its name is Grovian. <laughs> and of course, in the beginning, it was more like, yeah, doing a little bit research about uh, wind power plants. But um, yeah, nowadays, it's not only this one. There are many of it. more and more people are thinking about um, energy and also about the climate discussion and uh, in Germany we had a lot of nuclear energy and many people didn't like that form of technology they go out they demonstrate against it and we had a long discussion that was um, yeah, finally clarified when Fukushima happened. After that, Germany definitely decided to step out of nuclear energy and rebuild the energy system. And of course, we had really big power plants uh, with our nuclear power plants, coal power plants, and um, um, one characteristic of this energy system was that it was very centralized and now we are starting to rebuild the energy system from a centralized system to a more decentralized system with a lot of producer in form of um, wind power plants, solar panels or um, biomass. northern part of Germany, um, more than 10,000 solar panels and wind power plants alone are standing there and producing electricity instead of one or two big uh, centralized traditional power plants. <laughs> Of course, this needs a lot of investment in the grid system. So um, we start to rebuild the grid. Um, we need to, or also one characteristic, especially in the northern part of Germany, we have a lot of wind, but actually, or to be honest, the northern part of Germany hasn't the industry um, that need that kind of electricity. So you have to transport a lot of electricity from the north to the south. And therefore we, um, yeah, we invest a lot about um, for that kind of transport lines. And um, yeah, these are the pictures <laughs> to this chapter. <laughs> Actually, this is a really, really nice machine or a fascinating machine. Um, this machine is driving on, uh, on the beach and is responsible for the first meters to connect the mainland of Germany to an island called Helgoland. And actually this part of the machine is digging the hole and beyond that, the cable is 
put into the hole. And um, yeah, you see the um, the ground of the of the ocean is very sticky and very muddy and. Um, although this machine had that kind of condition, it's able to drive there and doing all, all the all the work that is necessary to put the cable there on the ground. So of course we invest a lot in the topics of digital um, digitalization of our grid system, um, sensor technology. Here, for example, we see some kind of new businesses that arise at the moment. Um, so we have also this kind of charging infrastructure, built the charging infrastructure for the electric vehicles. And we're also going to invest in the research about using hydrogen for energy, for our energy system. And of course, that's not enough. We also try to um, tackle the topic climate change. Um, our company sets the target that it wants to be climate neutral within the next 10 years. <music> So actually, this is our new slogan, more energy, less carbon dioxide. <laughs> I hope the movie was quite interesting for you. Um, I changed back to the presentation. I hope you still can see it. Yes, we are. Perfect. <laughs> so the Schleswig-Holstein answer here. Schleswig-Holstein is all this area in the north of Germany. We deliver electricity and gas for 2.5 million people in the northern part of Germany um, to 1,800 employees are working there. We have the 80, 80 young learning employees over 5,000 kilometers of electricity grid. 20,000 kilometer of natural gas infrastructure. Infrastructure. In total, we make with this a revenue of 2.6 billion euros. Um, the challenge I mentioned is to become climate neutral in 2030. Um, we identified therefore three areas. The first one is um, investing our, um, yeah is our company building infrastructure. We want there to save energy, to increase also the knowledge of the employees about climate change and methods for um, saving energy um, for our electricity and heating. We wanna use renewable energy, or if it's not possible to save, um, or it's not possible to use renewable energy, we want to invest in carbon dioxide compensation projects. The next step is our car fleet. Um, we want to exchange step by step the car fleet into electric or with electric vehicles. Therefore, we invest a lot in charging infrastructure 
And for example, last year we had a program um, where employees could lease um, a company car with, um, um, yeah, with an, an electrical motor and yeah, charge it at our parking space. <laughs> And the last and most challenging um, area is, of course, our grid and heating system. We want to use more green gas. That's, yeah, actually gas, for example, from biomass production, or at least green gas where, or gas where is some kind of uh, carbon dioxide compensation behind. Or we using pellets. I don't know if it's a common word, but actually pellets are compressed is, or is compressed wood at the end that is optimized for thermal processes. Um, this produced and then pressed in that in that um, in that form. Um, also heat pumps, or again, if it's not possible, it support the carbon dioxide compensation project. Okay, this month we have a really great breakthrough. Um, we have in combined heat and power plants. Normally it's run with natural gas and one of our combined heat and power plant is um, now replaced or uh, we, we ex made an experiment and in first step, natural gas was replaced with 8% hydrogen. And step by step, we adapted the kind of technology used now um, to adapt the gas motor. So we are capable to run it with 100% um, hydrogen. And it's, it's really nice because when you think about power to gas and especially renewable energy sometimes produce a lot of surplus of electricity. And when you use this electricity and electrolysis, you could produce uh, green hydrogen, which you maybe, or in the future, could fire in that kind of um, power plant. So um, now I'm at the end of this present presentation. Um, gracias por su atención. Um, I'm drinking now my tea, and if you have any questions, yeah, you're invited. <laughs> we can now start the discussion. Thank you very much, Steffi. Stephanie, Ben, thank you very much. That will be a really nice uh, presentation. And especially, I mean, at least for Costa Ricans that we are right now trying to move our country into renewable energies. I mean, listening what was happening and how was the development of that kind of energy in Germany. I mean, for us, it's, a, it's interesting and a, something really important to observe to see if we can manage to do that. I open the, uh, the conversation, the dialogue to someone else. Nuclear. Uh, I don't know if someone is uh, open to ask a question, please feel free or you can raise your hand on the Zoom or you can only open your microphone and feel free to ask a question. If someone wants to ask something, if not, I will start. Uh, Jose, please. Jose is the, uh, Stephanie, uh, the president of our student chapter. So Jose, welcome. Thanks. And first of all, I want to say thanks to Stephanie to be here, for be, to be here, sorry. Um, my question is about nuclear, nuclear energy. Um, after those um, discussions about nuclear energy in the, in the 70s, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, it was open to the to discussion later to bring, to bring it back at some point. Um, yeah, actually, uh, the, his, the history of that discussion is really interesting because um, actually, in the first time, Germany tried very hard to get access to a nuclear power plant because it was a technology arising after the Second World War. And as everyone knows, we were the bad guys and uh, the allies were very happy to 
defeat us. And there were also plans that Germany should be for all the time, not more than um, yeah, a country of farmers. So we were very happy that we received that access to that kind of technology. And that was one of the reason why we introduced or why the politicians were trying to very hard to introduce nuclear power plants and um, but later on more and more people think about the risk of these nuclear power plants and there were some accidents in great britain i'm not sure if we had bigger accidents in germany too but people didn't like the idea of having that kind of technology in the neighborhood. So with that kind of alternate alternatives like coal, like gas, like renewable energy, it was harder and harder to have that kind of, um, yeah, to have that kind of technology or support for that kind of technology. So we started a discussion. Um, but what's also important to, do, to consider that kind of power plants were belonging to private companies. So to make this politician or decision was really hard discussed because actually we forbid these private companies to do business in that um, area. So we need to, to speak about compensation, um, to speak when it's a good, time to end that kind of technologies. I mean, when you close that power plants, there are also a lot of working people there uh, who has no work at the end. But um, yeah, so I think, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure when exactly, but we decided to stop uh, to invest in that kind of technology um, at the first time, then there was a second discussion because of all the economics around and the doubts about uh, is our energy system capable or is it possible to have that kind of energy system without um, this nuclear power plant. But after Fukushima, this discussion stopped completely and uh, we decided very, or the politicians decided very, very quickly that we know definitely going to an end there. Stephanie, but now that Jose is asking that, I remember that was still some uh, nuclear plants open in Germany. Are they still open? Um, actually, I'm not sure if they are still open. I know there are a lot of power plants that are now going to be uh, deconstructed. Okay. Um, but I I don't think that they're running anymore. And, and that brings me to another question. I, if someone wants to ask, please feel free to raise your hand and, or open your microphone. But Stephanie, I also remember, for example, in Leipzig, that people was using coal, uh, uh, carbon, mm -hmm. for some of the energy, at least in Saxon. This situation is, uh, of course, provoking a lot of pollution. Mm -hmm. Is the same in, in, in the north of Germany or also the carbon you're trying to decrease the use of carbon and coal for uh, the warming houses? Oh, actually, we have now a new discussion in Germany. After quit with nuclear power plants, we now think about quit, quitting with coal power plants too. Yeah. That's quite hard, especially for areas around Leipzig, um, because the economy, um, yeah, you, you have a lot of people working in that kind of area and it's quite historic and a big thing for that area. So for them, it's really hard to say goodbye to that kind of technology. Um, we in the North, we don't have that kind of problem <laughs> because they've been I think yeah we never had that kind of resources in the northern part of Germany okay we are a really windy country so for us um, wind power plants onshore offshore yeah it's quite practical so that that means Stephanie that right now for example the the high 
percentage of the energy you use in the north is coming from the wind? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's um, it's quite windy, and actually, we produce more renewable energy than actually we can um, consume in the northern part of Germany. Mm -hmm. So um, we in invest a lot of this in this transport line that we are able to bring the surplus of renewable energy in the north to the south. And actually, this is a really big challenge in Germany. As I mentioned before, we had this huge centralized power plants that were next to the big cities, next to the industries that need that kind of electricity. And now we have a decentralized system. We have in the north um, a lot of spots with wind, with wind power, um, also a little bit biomass. We have in the south more um, spots or a lot of good spots for, for solar power plants and now we just need to have a transport system that brings every everything from the spots everywhere to um, the places where the electricity is needed. Okay. Because in the northern part of Germany, we don't have this, um, yeah, this huge industry like chemical producers, like mm. car manufacturer, like other big industries that needs a lot of electricity. Uh, if someone wants to ask a question, please, again, feel free. I mean, we are almost finishing this uh, conversation. One of the questions that I have, because right now in Costa Rica, people is really happy about hydrogen. It was Last year, in the last two years, was a huge discussion about using hydrogen in Costa Rica. And now I think there is two buses running in San Jose with hydrogen, I think. How is it going, the situation with that? Because here was, uh, some of the people was talking about that was really expensive and really dangerous, the manage of the hydrogen. Um, I think in Germany, this kind of discussion is starting. And as I mentioned before, we are also making some, some research in that area. Um, but yes, you're right, it's still very expensive. But I think this is a problem that you could solve by good politician or good politics. Because in Germany, when you think about 1990 with the start of renewable energy, no one wanted to invest in solar panels. No one wanted to invest in uh, wind power plants because they were too expensive in comparison to nuclear energy to the coal power plants and so on. So um, yeah, the, the politicians decided to bring there some kind of renewable energy um, law who promotes that kind of development, who gives safety, who gives supporting money and so on. And I think when you, um, when you want to change the system, the politicians first have to do or implement some kind of um, promoting yeah. law or promoting system so that that kind of technologies have a chance from to, to change their searches from research projects to uh, a mass product. Yeah. Uh, Mariale Sanchez, you have a question, please feel free. Yeah, hi. Um, my main question is that if there are any plans or discussions right now to offset the environmental impact that the heavy use of wind energy causes to the environment. And I also would like to know if there are any plans or ideas or discussions as to expanding this um, use of energy or this technology that you have in Germany into a much larger scale. Okay. Um, could you could you repeat the question? We were very uh, far. I... Yeah, try, try to be closer to the microphone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Isaac. Um, how about there? Perfect. Okay. Better. So my questions are: If there are any plans or discussions right now in the search of upsetting the environmental impact that the heavy use of wind energy causes to the environment? 
because of the damage of the ecosystems to create these plants. And if there are any plans, ideas, or discussions to expand this kind of programs and technologies that you have in Germany into a much bigger scale. Thank you. Um, to answer the, your question, if we want to uh, um, increase renewable energy, definitely, um, because yeah, we quit with nuclear energy. We also want to quit with coal energy. So of course, somewhere the electricity has to come from. And of course the answer are renewable energies. So we just still want to, to build that kind of stuff and uh, yeah, to increase the amount of renewable energy um, at, our, at our system. And of course there are different discussions. No technology is perfect. You always have some kind of environmental influence. Um, but we also have a very good environmental law. And actually every project that is um, built in Germany has before some environmental checkup. And um, if there are any, uh, are any impacts that you have to consider, they must be considered and I must, um, must um, do something for the, for the environment instead. Or for example, um, one point is um, when you think about that sometimes, um, or this for example is an issue that is sometimes discussed and you have an area with wind power plants and you have an area with beds. And for example, the law is forcing the private companies just to quit the, the running of the wind power plant during the night. And um, so the bats could live there and do, they, do the thing. And um, for us, it's okay. And we, we try always to balance the economic, um, the economic benefit with the with the chain or with the with the damage for the environment. I mean, just to stop that kind of wind power plan for the night means for the for the owner of this kind of plant that he must calculate with two up to three percent less revenue. But um, the environmental law just forces him to do it like that, and this is with a lot of topics there so um, clearly we have that in in mind but we also have in mind that we need electricity i don't know if mariale want to reply something or if so we want to ask another question we are already i mean i think it's already four here and also uh, 11 p.m in germany right <laughs> as, as someone else if not, Stephanie, I want to thank you, really. I mean, for Costa Ricans right now, this is a really important topic. There is also some environmental engineering students right now with us. And I'm sure this kind of conversations are useful for us because we need also to learn from the German experience. Uh, uh, Fabian, please. Um, hi, yeah, I enjoy your presentation. How many languages uh, do you have to learn uh, to study in Moscow? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, it was very practical for me. Of course, the, the study program was in English, so you should be very good in English just to understand and listen to the teachers. Um, then it was also an advantage that I, yeah, that my native language is German because I had the impression that when you go outside of the university, um, Russians, it's more likely that Russians speak German than English <laughs> because we have some, some um, points, points in history that uh, were quite similar, I would say. So Russian people still, yeah, like German culture and for them it's quite, yeah, sometimes still usual to learn German. 
and um, if you're yeah but at the end of course it's always good to to learn or to have a little bit Russian in mind because in my experience um, the academic people are capable to speak English but in the city and everywhere else it's it's Russian um, no, yeah. and that's a, that, that's a really good question, Stephanie, because there is many students here that maybe would like to do as you did to go, for example, to, I mean, a really far away country like Russia. What about Russia in this topic? I mean, they have a lot of experience on uh, this uh, economical and the relation with the environmental part. Actually, the Russian perspective is quite different. I okay. mean, they are a land where they are producing energy and uh, producing natural resources like gas and oil, and they exporting it all over the world and receive a lot of revenues. And um, for them, I think it's really hard to to understand that this system is going to change. And at this time, they were, of course, looking what is Europe doing, but to be honest, they were not believing in, uh, or at least in my opinion, mm -hmm. they did not believe that this kind of change is um, um, will work. Yeah. So they trust very much in their natural resources and environmental discussion was not so not so big and renewable energy uh, it was just like a like a trend or a short term trend for them. But I think I, I cannot say how it is now or in this year, but I think also Russia needs to or will rethink because they see what is happening in the world. They see what is happening in, um, yeah, in the important markets all over the world. And so I think they will start to discuss more about this environmental and renewable topics too. So Stephanie, at the end, will you suggest someone to go to Russia, for example, for a master's degree? It's a nice experience. It's a really nice experience. Mm. Traveling always helps. And um, even when you don't speak Russian, <laughs> no. you, I mean, I went to Asia and I didn't speak Chinese and I couldn't read Chinese and I survived somehow. So it's always possible to go into another country and to survive there. Yeah. You just go to people, speak with them or trying to speak with them, explain with pictures, explain with your hands and showing things. And it's a really, really nice experience. Yeah. Also for your personal development. And I think that's the best conclusion we can have from today because for students, for me, it's also really important to tell them. And now that you tell them that go up, go abroad, international experience is so important, not only professional, but also personal. Yes. Uh, Stephanie, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, for your time. Uh, Melanie also wrote you. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, good night. Good night, Steffi. Schlaf good. <risa> eh, buenas noches a todos de parte del capítulo estudiantil de la American Chemical Society. Thank you very much, everybody, for um, the student chapter uh, tecnológico de Costa Rica, the student chapter from the American Chemical Society. Uh, this uh, presentation will be in some hours in our YouTube channel, so you can share with your colleagues and also keep updated about the next ones on uh, our networks and our uh, social media on Facebook or Instagram. In two weeks, we have the presentation of uh, Alexandra Elbakian, that is the um, founder of SciHop. So you are more than welcome to join us. That, by the way, that talk is in Russian. So we need to look for a, translation, a translator between Russian and, and English or Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie, muchas gracias. Hasta luego. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you.